Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever and into ages of ages. Amen. Welcome back, Father Sebastian, for our gospel reflection here for the seventh Sunday of Ordinary Time. I've been hard at work putting up this background backdrop here for everybody, been painting it, all the details, making sure all the words are perfect. Yeah, very much similar to your chalkboard over there. Is that a real chalkboard, Father Sebastian? Or is that just a backdrop? It's like fake. That's real slate. I think you had somebody knock while you did that action. Yeah. Anyway, seventh Sunday of ordinary time. We have the theme of the purpose of holiness because, you know, we're at the, you talk about knocking, we're knocking on the door of Lent. So the church puts before us now this theme of holiness throughout the readings that we have and this sense of preparation for the journey which is coming. And I'll just mention it now. Uh, I know I've mentioned it to all of our Institute friends uh, in the past, but I'll mention it now. That is that it's time to pack your bags. If you haven't packed your bags yet for the journey, eh, don't do it. Don't wait till Ash Wednesday and you wake up in the morning and I got to go get my ashes. I got to do all this stuff too late. When you're going to go on a journey, got to pack your bags for the journey so you can successfully cross the sea of the great fast and prepare yourself for the resurrection of Christ our God. So let's jump right in here now into the these texts. If you're writing down and taking notes, write these down. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 17 through 18. Leviticus 19, verse 1 and 2, and verse 17 and 18. Then uh, the response royal psalm is taken from Psalm 103. Um, psalm 103. And then the gospel is Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48, 38 through 48, and the epistle is Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 through 23, Corinthians, chapter 1 Corinthians, sorry, chapter 3, verse 16 through 23. So let's jump right in there, grab your Bible, and uh, put your cell phones away. If, by the way, you see me reading from my screen, while I'm reading the biblical text, it's not because I don't have my Bible in front of me. It's just that the USCCB uses the unfortunate translation of the New American Bible for the readings at Mass, which is not really the best translation, if you ask my brother, and he knows. So anyways, so get out your old trusty Bible, whatever you got. But if, uh, you know, you got, I use, my, I use the, the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition printed nice edition put out by ignatius press this is the old timey one um and uh but nevertheless i want to read the text that you'll be hearing at mass from the new american translation for what it is okay leviticus chapter 19 verse 1 and 2 and 17 through 18 the lord said to moses speak to the whole israelite community and tell them be whole be holy for i the lord your god am holy you shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen. Do not incur sin because of him. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Father Sebastian, this is, of course, a moral teaching which is applicable to all ages and in all places, but originally given in a particular historical, historical context. So, uh, you know, most of us, the book of Leviticus is kind of like this shrouded and not sure what's going on there. So maybe you could kind of open the veil and let us see in. All right. So the book of Leviticus is one of the books or a book that contains the information that was revealed to Moses at Mount Sinai. So we, we know the book of the Exodus that tells us this is their trip from Egypt to Mount Sinai. But once they get to Sinai after the golden calf incident, they have a number of extra regulations, a good number of them, that end up becoming now what we call the Book of Leviticus. They probably would not have had the Book of Leviticus, at least as we have it here, if the golden calf incident had not happened. But that's what happened. And so they get this Book of Leviticus, which is basically the sacramentary of the Levitical priesthood. 
here you've got these Levitical priests now, the line of Aaron, who is the only one, they're the only ones to allowed to offer sacrifice after the golden calf and sin. And, and then they have all of these regulations, you know, if it's a Tuesday and the wind's blowing from the east, then you stand on your left foot and you offer a pigeon versus a dove, all these very, very critical and very particular laws that they get in the book of Leviticus. But the book of Leviticus is much more than that in the sense it has some very basic, deep, and perennial theology in it. It has in there also the basic theology of salvation history, and we find that at the heart of the book. In the five books of Moses, the Torah, in the center is this book, Leviticus. Well, in the center of the book, Leviticus, is the what's called the holiness code, for lack of a better term, because it refers to holiness over and over again. This is chapter 17 through 22. And it's called the holiness code because as we see in this verse that's, that's printed right here that we just read, chapter 19, verse 2, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so holiness, we talked about this last week. Holiness is to be set apart, distinct. And for the Israelites, they were to be set apart unlike the nations. It was the holiness code about all else that made them unlike the nations. The other laws in Leviticus, um, some of them you might find some parallels among the nations, but the holiness code makes them wholly unlike the nations. Uh, among the nations, you don't find this kind of stuff. <coughs> you must be distinct. You must be different. He says, unlike the nations, for I, the Lord your God, am unlike the pagan gods. So you're going to be unlike them, just like un unlike their gods. But there was a purpose, of course, and we're going to see this as we continue reading in our study today. But basically, as, you, as we read in, the, in this holiness code, he says, and you must love your neighbors yourself. You must love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're going to be separated from the nations, unlike the nations, to be with God, obviously there's a purpose that be with God, then we're going to grow into his image and likeness. We're going to become like him. And therefore, we're going to begin to like or love our neighbor, even as he does, right? There's, there's going to be a, there's, there must be some fruit that's born from this setting apart to be unlike the nations, to be like God. And then that's, of course, what, what we're going to find in Matthew's gospel later on. You know, we, we came across this last week in, in the text we were looking at about the question of license, not like my driver's license, but a license in the sense of this, this idea of, of freedom to do whatever I want, which is, of course, abuse of freedom. And here, we, it seems that, that we're called to love our neighbor, but as you rightly said, to love our neighbor as God loves him, which is always a demanding love. I think, uh, you know, parents understand this, that authentic love is never license. This is like, this happens today in, in maybe among some young people raising their children that they give them license to do whatever. Um, that's not authentic love. And here we're given uh, a great example of that in this text. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart. Though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen, do not incur sin because of him. Sin is always a, is, is, is kind of this selfishness, this movement toward myself, using the other for my own sake. But we are to love as God loves, which is to give our life for the other, that they might live uh, according to the image and likeness of God that was placed in their heart. So there's always this, this love to kind of assist the person in their in the in the pursuit of authentic uh, uh, restoration of that image and likeness in their life and, and really that doesn't that just change accord as far as what Israel's living in the, the pagan context of what they're living in where there's clearly maybe some distance between me and my brother <laughs> not you father Sebastian but I mean uh, uh, where it says do, take no revenge right and take cherish no grudge against any of your people. This is a, uh, we don't have to get into this too much, but I mean, there's this, there's this delicate thing here where this authentic love, there's obviously, there's, there's a distance. Uh, something has happened where revenge is possible or holding a grudge is possible.
But then the Lord says, no, the way I react to the person who I have some division with is always to give my life for them, not in a sense of giving them license to do whatever they want, but to always love them into existence, if you will, love them, uh, uh, as you said rightly, as the Lord our God uh, loves them. Of course, we get this theme. Jesus picks this theme up all over the New Testament. We get it in John's first epistle that we have to love our neighbor if we're going to truly love God. And this is, puts us ultimately into our Lenten season, right? This restoration of the relationship with, with the Lord and the relationship with our, with our neighbor. But again, a, re, a restoration that is based upon truth. And then the responsorial psalm. The Lord is kind and merciful. The Lord is kind and merciful. And, and in that, we can, like you said, we are to be kind of incorporated into the way God acts. So we chant this over and over again this Sunday in this way that we accept this reality of this authentic kindness and mercy in our own life in relationship to our neighbor. The gospel text is taken from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48. So let's take a look at that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48 of quite a famous text. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48. Jesus said to his disciples, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn your back on the one who wants to borrow. You have heard it that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father. For he makes his son rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same. If you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Father Sebastian, we, there's, there's much to say here, but I'm sure much that our pastors are going to pick up in their homily from a kind of a, a, a moral standpoint. But maybe you can, first of all, just paint, as we usually do, the context here. Where are we in the gospel story? And, and kind of why is Jesus beginning to talk in this way now? So this is the very beginning of his Galilean ministry. After the baptism and then the 40 days in the wilderness, we hear that he heads north up into Galilee, and there he begins to preach. And crowds begin to follow him. This is also when he calls the disciples. And then he goes up onto the hill, up onto that, the, to the mountain, which uh, the place will be called the Sermon on the Mount, eventually this, this spot. And... In this little hill above the Sea of Galilee, the very beautiful place, you and I have been there many times together, he then begins to talk to them about a transition from the old to the new. What they had heard before and what he is now telling them. And he shows them that there's, it, it's complementary. It's not as if somehow what Jesus is saying is opposite of what was said before, but rather what he's saying fulfills what was said before. It's not that somehow what God is saying to them now in Jesus and the new covenant is, is contradictory, but in the end, it has the same tell us the same purpose. And we're going to see that as we continue reading the gospel, you know, to love God and your neighbors yourself, right? To return to Eden. That's the, the, the purpose there. So that's the basic <laughs> historical context. Oh, okay. Maybe you could pick up for us in this, this, uh, these ideas of holiness again. We talk about being perfect as our heavenly father is perfect you know what is what what are the those listening to jesus out there in the hills of galilee thinking and and you know what is the challenge going on in their life that jesus begins talking this way so that's a, a really good question especially in this post-exilic period right the israelites had uh, tragically they'd been brought well to, to start from the beginning abraham had been brought from the nations so he could be unlike the nation, so he could be like God. And then, of course, his descendants eventually start to become more like the nations, right? We have the story of Israel down in Egypt, and they become, after 400 years, like Egypt. 
So then God brings them out of Egypt. It's an Abraham calling all over again. And the call for Abraham was so that he could be the one through whom all the nations could be blessed, right? That God would bless all nations through him. Well, God is the source of blessing. So Abraham must somehow become like God for him to be the source of the blessing. And so the Israelites have failed to do this, but God calls them back to that original calling. He brings them down to Mount Sinai from Egypt, where he now says, look, guys, I want you to be separate from the nations, but that means you must be like me. You must be like I am. And, and then, then now you're that physical relation, you're that physical image of the invisible God. So the nations can now know who I am. Well, that, that was Sinai, okay? And then it goes downhill again from there, as we read in the book of Joshua and Judges and the things. Things aren't going so well. And there are high points and low points, but basically the thing keeps kind of going downhill until we get to another Egypt in a certain sense. We get to the Babylon exile. When the Babylonians now conquer Egypt and take them off, take them off into a foreign land again. It's, it's the Exodus story all over again. It's the Abraham story. Now, in fact, they return to the place from which Abraham was called. So as if, as if the whole thing was undone. The whole purpose, the call of Abraham, his descendants have over and over failed. They just continue to go back to be like the nations. They cannot be like God if they, if they, if they continue to be like the nations. So they go off in exile, and then now they've come back. And so now they've come back. In the post exile period, there, there's this fervor we find among the Pharisees. And we talked about this last week. The Pharisees and the scribes are making sure they keep the law. Look, we, we messed up a number of times. Let's not do it again, please. And, and let's, let's make sure we keep the law perfectly. And then maybe the Romans will be cast out of our land, and God's glory cloud, and then it'll all be restored. And we will finally, finally we will be, God's physical image on earth, the one through whom he will reveal his glory so that all the nations that do not yet know him as we know him will come to know he who is the invisible God. That's, that's basically their calling. But tragically, they're just stopping short again. They're unlike the nations, but they haven't yet made that next leap to be like God. You know, we don't have to get into this epistle text too much i just want to point out the first paragraph of it from first corinthians chapter 3 verse starting with verse 16 based on what you were just saying and then i want to just conclude with and i always love to look at the homily of saint john chrysostom on fasting as we head into this lenten season but there in in first corinthians he says it's first corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 brothers and sisters do you not know that you are the temple of god the spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. And, you know, how important that's, that's that kind of hits at the center, doesn't it? To realize it, it's not just a matter of fulfilling the law, but this realization of what is indwelling in us and who is indwelling in us. Um, and this, this constant realization of my communion with the Lord, and which, which, just, which kind of breaks apart the whole the kind of law obligation aspect of my of my of my faith and because now if i'm in constant remembrance of uh, of the lord's presence in my life then and the indwelling of the holy spirit allowing that spirit of god to act and, and to live through me then i am transformed and in my life the law is fulfilled just as it is fulfilled in the life of christ and this isn't this now i'm glad you brought up this exodus business because that's what we have before us is an exodus out of the Egypt of our life in which we have been misusing oftentimes all the things around us. Worst of all, our relationship with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors. But, you know, going back even to Adam and Eve, this misuse of the created order for their own purposes, rather than the transformation of the created order for the blessing of God. This is what the fast, the journey of Lent is all about. And I would encourage all of our participants. I know that the church today, the fasting regulations are kind of a little bit on the lax side or whatever. And it's oftentimes we hear, oh, just be nice to your, just be nice to a person. That's the point. Well, yeah, but the fathers of the church, the saints are, are, aren't stupid. Right? They're the wise, the wise men that have gone before us. They know that we become so attached to the passions and towards going out toward the things of this world, primarily food. It's one of those things that like, I'm hungry. I always eat. So that in their wisdom, the, the fathers of the church say, no, 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 get this, 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 this under control. 
reestablish your the intellect over your will um, that you might choose what is true and good and then put all things in its proper order. It's why on Easter we can feast as Christians because it's not that the created order and these things are bad, but that we've been misusing them out of their proper order in our life. Forgetting that we are first and foremost the temple of God, the indwelling, the place of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, then I'm in a relationship with the Lord and in a relationship with my brother and sister who is called also to this fullness of communion. I'll just, I think we can just kind of bring this all to an end with a few words from St. John Chrysostom. We're going to link this homily on fasting. Listen to this. He says, fasting is the change of every part of our life because the sacrifice of the fast is not the abstinence, but the distancing from sin. The abstinence from food, obviously, speaking of. Uh, Therefore, whoever limits the fast to the deprivation of food, he is the one who in reality abhors and ridicules the fast. Are you fasting? Show me your fast with your works. Which works? If you see someone who is poor, show him mercy. If you see an enemy, reconcile with him. You see a friend who is becoming successful, do not be jealous of him. If you see a beautiful woman on the street, pass her by. In other words, not only should the mouth fast, but the eyes and legs and arms of all and all the other parts of the body should fast as well. Let the hands fast, remaining clean from stealing and greediness. Let the legs fast, avoiding roads which lead to sinful sights and so forth. He says, and then he says this, let the mouth fast from disgraceful and abusive words. Because what gain is there when on the one hand, we avoid eating a chicken and fish and the other, and on the other, we chew up and consume our brother. He who condemns and blasphemes is as if he has eaten brotherly meat, as if he has bitten into the flesh of his fellow man. It is because of this that Paul frightened us, saying, if you chew up and consume one another, be careful that you do not annihilate yourself. We have a big challenge in a road ahead of us here in the, in the coming weeks, uh, the 40 days of Lent. And we have these beautiful words given to us here in, during Mass. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart. So let us begin now uh, to reconcile, to begin this journey of the fast with forgiveness here. There is a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a co-worker that we have something against. Uh, let us go to them and ask forgiveness. It doesn't mean turning a blind eye to sin. It doesn't mean not telling the truth. But if in some ways we have broken a relationship, allowed that break to kind of fester, now is the time to go and to ask forgiveness and to restore the authentic love which is in the Holy Trinity in our relationships with one another. Uh, to Christ our God be glory, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.